I'm used to talking to nine-year-olds, um, and um, someone said, but there are lots of nine-year-olds in the room. Uh, I work here. Um, this is, and it's not that I'm that old, but uh, this is uh, the Whitney Armory in the picture that gets into history books more than any other picture. Two, three reasons. One, it's beautiful, and by the time we started talking about the Industrial Revolution, it wasn't so beautiful. Two, he went to Yale. And people who go to Yale write history books or <laughs> other kinds of blogs. And of course, you want to credit one of your own with causing the Industrial Revolution. And three, it was the first Big Ideas Fest. That is, yes, Whitney made fame but not fortune with a cotton gin. He came here because in 1798, uh, Nelson met Napoleon in the Nile, and um, Jefferson needed muskets. Yesterday, Kimberly said, it's not the guns, but the technology that makes revolutions. Whitney said, I've made more armorers than arms. That is, I've educated people. I've created a new kind of worker. It was sort of, that was awkward because they kept going off and forming other companies. But that's where we began. Um, I trained, let me see where I'm going. Except it looks like this now. And the thing that you, sh one thing I take away from this experience is that good light is important for inventive people. Whitney's Armory was always beautifully integrated with the environment, and it still is. These are our workshops. We have five or something buildings, and we build projects. We're not a museum that collects things so much as we collect people, young, inventive people who can build just about anything. I trained as a clinical social worker, and in my second year internship, I was in a suburban school in Westchester County. I was at Columbia, and um, they sent me all these fourth, fourth graders who were, in my eyes, brilliant, but failing in school, and they said, fix them. And I went, wait a minute. Um, they're the smartest kids in your school. What makes you think? that they have a problem. Maybe the school has a problem. And at the same time, I realized they had problems that looked like the problems I had when I was a fourth grader. And so I became curious. And when I was a fourth grader, I had a magnificent teacher who let me build puppets. And it was the only thing I ever did well in school. My puppets were really good. So I started looking for content that would um, let these kids do what they needed to do. And just by luck and serendipity and in prototyping, trust your instinct. Your first, your first prototype will be pretty good. Just by instinct, um, uh, go back one. Um, just by instinct, I ran into drawings in one of Leonardo's notebooks. I was looking for some robots, but I found a whole lot of really amazing drawings. This one, for example, the lower drawing looks like the insides of what? Clock, you got it quickly, good. And trust me, every second grader some, in every group, somebody will know it's a clock. And what, what Leonardo did was he took that clockwork mechanism, which was brand new in his time, and he transformed it. He put it onto, what, what is it above once he's put wheels on it? It's a car, or if you're super clever, a second grader once said, a time machine. Um, <laughs> and. If I tell you that the time machine or the, the Leonardo's little vehicle is meant to look like this, and if you wind it up and let it travel, if I tell you it looks like this and it goes in that direction, what's this and where did Leonardo get it from? It's a rudder from a boat. So in one project, he completely illustrates how his creative mind works. He borrows things, he takes the motor from a clock, he takes the rudder from a boat, and he transforms it. And later on in his life, he'll transform it and he'll make it into a lion for the king of France, and we'll get to that. Um, so there it is as a car. There it is, the first time I drew it um, for a book that I published, you need, when you're talking about prototyping, to show drawings you wish didn't exist anymore. Uh, the mousetrap, not such a good idea. Um, eventually, we'll put rubber bands on it. We put some on your table for you to take home. It's a test. You'll learn more about the test later. Um, and basically, it works the same way, except there's a lot more flexibility with the rubber band. And yes, it can be front wheel drive or uh, back wheel drive. I don't even know which way. 
Uh, and we'll talk some about this car and all the variations that we've made of it. Here it is transformed into, very cleverly, a pumpkin that transforms into a carriage, so it's a transforming transformation that transforms. And, and the other one is a bookmobile, which I thought it was gonna be different, but it's a bookmobile, we, hundreds of them. We, transforming things is one thing, being able to move um, in, a great distance is another. Um, whoa, in any case, um, now, now, now go back, now go back to. Um, so the thing is about your projects, let them talk to you. And the thing I loved about this project is we started building lots of them. And we discovered this, in every large group of people who made the projects, three out of four kids whose cars went the farthest would have never won a spelling bee. That's good. My kids in the school, not good spellers. Me, not good spellers. Leonardo, not good spellers. And it's a long story as to how it, we go back one more. Um, we, so we build cars, we measure them for distance. And it's very reassuring to the kids who've never been best in class that on the day in which we build rubber band cars, they'll be best. Not always, but pretty often, an impressive amount. So much so that we got to do lots of research for the Javits gifted LD program, none of which was very exciting. I mean, we did the research and the kids learned and many of them have worked for me for years, but once it got converted into discussions of dyslexia and tools for making those kids more successful in college, not so successful. Then I met, uh, next slide, next slide, I can do this, Julie Logan, um, a, an English researcher who took a completely different approach to looking at impatient students who'd succeeded brilliantly, 20% of English entrepreneurs are dyslexic, 35% of American entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs are dyslexic. She didn't bother with thinking, how could I have fixed them? She asked the question, wait, what made them, what let them be so successful? It turns out mentorship, apprenticeship, um, letting them surround themselves with people who could do the things they wanted to do incredible, valuable research, not done by an educator. Well, she's an educator of sort. Um, this isn't the order in which I thought this would go, but okay, three out of four, um, three out of four children with um, cars um, that go the farthest are not good spellers. Second grade, what do you think, girls or boys? Whose car goes farther? Girls. girls. Fourth grade, fifth grade? High. Seventh grade, whose cars go farther? Boys, by about 20%. Why is that? All girls in fifth grade know, well, in second grade, the boys were so clueless they couldn't follow instructions. <laughs> and then they sit there for a while and they go, oh, wait a minute. You mean all that not following instructions let them be better than us? That's wrong. So all across Connecticut, 100 schools, we never found a seventh grade until one, where the seventh grade girls just obliterated seventh grade boys. We went, whoa, how'd you do this? And the teachers went, oh, we didn't even know we did it. Soccer. I went, what do you mean soccer? Our girls are aggressive, they run hard, they kick hard. Nah, tell me more about yourself. Oh, I'm ordinary except for my tattoos, and I'm certain that the students have never seen my tattoos. I'm ordinary except for my motorcycle, and I only rode it to school that one time. I'm ordinary except I just got back from Hong Kong where I was judging the world finals in African violets. And then you go, whoa, who hired you? And it turns out that in New Canaan, Connecticut, 10 years before there had been a person hiring um, teachers who liked bold, independent women. And it's amazing how transformative education can be if you have women who see things differently. Your students see things differently, all from rubber band powered cars. It's a prototype, it's prob problematic, but. So here's an application of a rubber band powered car. This is a, a, a car built for the Odyssey of the Mind competition. And it's part about letting go of what your projects are doing for you. And um, at Odyssey of the Mind was a competition. We would go off, we won in Connecticut every time. And this one in Akron, we came in about 18th. And the next time we came in 18th. And this student, there should be an arrow there, that's Jennifer Oxley. At the end of this competition, no, the one just before this, she said, 
I'm tired of coming in 18th. I've seen 45 competitions. Go see these five coaches. I want to find out what they're doing because we have to do. She's 12 years old. And so I meet these guys, three of them, they're English. They go, oh, we saw your work, it's great. How many hours did you spend doing it? Uh, about 90 hours. They said, no, go to 200 hours, you'll beat us. And I said, 200 hours? He said, look, in England, when we train, when we train for long-term tests, we don't do it at the last minute the way you guys do it. We do it the whole time. You spend 200 hours. Jen, we're riding back to, to uh, Connecticut. She says, 200 hours, that's four work weeks. You're too disorganized. Let us run the museum. You give us the 200 hours. And here she is winning the first silver medal. She didn't get a gold medal until her day when she's running her company in New York doing animation. Um, she still begrudges me the fact that <laughs> she could have been the first gold medal from Connecticut. But she started something that's absolutely essential to our work. She took the control from those of us who were running it and put it in her hands because she's actually far more capable and visionary than um, we are. We have lots of apprentices, 85 of the apprentices. This is a remarkable collection of them. Um, there is among them, there are among them, there is among them, one Yale, one Brown, one Harvard, one Penn, and then there are the rest of them who dropped out of something. At 12, they're all equal, they, and some of them got back in after they dropped out. The one in the front on the left is number four at Harvard in the IT department. He dropped out of high school in 10th grade because he said, when I'm in math and when I'm in American history class, I'm, when I'm in American history class, I'm breathing as if I'm going to lose my breath. I can't breathe. When I'm on my computer, I'm moving with every neuron in my body. So he dropped out, educated himself, and he runs the network at Harvard now, or he's one of the IT people that keeps Harvard going. Wait a minute, how come the guys that on the top that went to Ivy League schools had it easy, and the guys who had to become, had to educate themselves so that they could run the gardens at Hotchkiss and the food service at Hotchkiss and run the sustainable gardens, where was the school for them? We were kind of a school, but where did they go? What do you tell a kid who needs to drop out of high school but could be the best auto mechanic in the world? I don't know, there's not an answer. There aren't places to send kids who are brilliantly talented with their hands and uh, don't have a creative outlet. Um, what you do is you collect all kinds of students because, let's see, the girl on the upper right is the first girl to fly on the US free flight team. We also had the first African American to fly on the uh, US free flight team. The left, the um, electronic circuit on the left is, was designed by one of our students. We think it's better than anything make has. Um, the sewing, it's amazing how much they love sewing. The micro pottery down there, the girl who designed that won a $12,000 scholarship because she realized you could make tiny pots and in a whole week, in one week you could make a whole line of pottery things and so forth. We build lots of things only because we have lots of students with lots of interests and lots of talent. There's an answer. Yesterday the answer was 110, 100. My answer is 18. Um, you're so, nobody's built the car. Has anybody built the car? You could have built the car. You see, th there you go. So a guy built the car. Um, <laughs> broke my heart here, but here, here, here's your assignment. Leave the car uh, on your desk someplace at school or at work. The person who comes up to it and goes, I can't believe you made it that way. I'll make it better. That person's probably not a good speller, but sees the world <laughs> and trusts their own eye. Um, we're not all old fashioned things. These are CNC routers. Um, when your CNC router goes, oh cool, I could make a, um, a wheel with its pie times the diameter, it's exactly one foot when it's pointless. Except for the kid who said, no, nah, spray paint it gold and put it on a lanyard and give it to the teacher. She can wear it like an icon. Then we'll learn about pie, but who wants one for your car? And that's what we do. We invent things that are pleasurable and satisfying to kids who like to use their hands. Thank you very much.